Okay, so welcome back and let's start with the second lecture. Let me briefly remind you what we did. So last time, we defined a simplicial sets and can complexes. In particular, we saw a very important example of can complex. So if Y is a topological space, we have a can complex thing Y. Can complex whose n simplices are uh, the continuous maps from the topological n simplex into Y. Um, and this is part, thing is part of an adjunction. So we have um, geometricalization, left the joint to sing. And actually, let me spell it out a little bit more than uh, what we did last time. So we have, so remember, geometricalization of a simplicial set X is essentially gluing one topological n simplex for every n simplex of x module a certain equivalence relation that tells you the simplicial structure maps control the gluing. So let me actually put a few remarks about this. So the remark one is that this is always a CW complex. With, uh, uh, with M skeleton, the image of what you obtain by gluing all topological synthesis of dimension less or equal than M. Sorry, not subduction, just map. Uh, and uh, uh, N cells in bijection with the non degenerate simplices. And by non degenerate simplices, here I mean simplices that are not the image of one of those degeneracy maps that I discussed. Um, oh, um, Actually, yeah, right. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the first remark. And the other remark, I want to be a little bit more explicit about this adjunction about how the unit and co-unit maps work. So we actually, I think, discussed already one of them, which is the uh, co-unit map. So remember, this is just a quotient by definition, a quotient of this guy map into Y. And in fact, this sends T comma F to F of T. Um, I think we implicitly discussed it in the proof of the adjunction, this map. Um, I think we didn't spell it out, so I'm doing it now for, for concreteness sake. And the other is mapping, sorry, from X to sing of the geometricalization of X. In fact, this is sending sigma and n simplex to the map delta n to, to this which is just uh, inclusion of delta n times sigma. I mean, it's not really an inclusion because we are quotienting out. But. And since these two maps are very important, actually, let me give them names. I think I need to call them eta, this one, and epsilon, this one. In the notes. 
they're the unit and the co-unit, uh, since they are important and they're going to be pretty much the main goal. Understanding them is going to be pretty much the main goal of today. Uh, I wanted to spell them out. And okay, so goal for today. is to prove the following two facts. So epsilon is a weak equivalence. Epsilon, remember, is this map here, this um, co-unit map from the geometricalization of Singh. And eta is a homotopy equivalence if x is a Kahn complex. So the upshot, which is pretty much the main reason why I'm doing the simplicial homotopy theory, um, very quick introduction, is that Singh Y knows everything about the weak homotopy type of Y. And in fact, I will often refer to Sing Y as the weak homotopy type of Y, because it contains all the information up to homotopy equivalence. That's just to tell you where we're going. Um, okay. So where were we so when we stopped? Oh wait, let me let me actually pause one second for questions. Excuse me, yes. Um, in the last line of the remark above, what is the thing in in uh, curly brackets? This? Yes. It's inclusion, yeah. Uh, this is just a single term of sigma. sigma. So sigma is so sigma an element, is of, this element set. of this set. Right? And then I can take its, its singleton is a subset here. OK, thank you. OK, further questions? No, OK. So, OK, let's let's go back to homotopy groups. So remember, if we have two sigma tau in Xn, X is a kind of complex now, um, we say that sigma is homotopic to tau let me put it like this actually. Well, okay, say sigma is homotopic to tau relative to the boundary if uh, there exists a term in x n plus one and n plus one simplex such that the n phase in sigma, the n plus one is tau, and then uh, for the other i's, we have this relationship, which is not very important in details uh, because, uh, well, because we are going to be interested in the cases where uh, sigma and tau have constant boundary. So in which case, this is just saying that the other faces of eta are constant maps at the base point. Uh, and we define pi n, pi n x comma x as the set of uh, n simplices such that uh, 
the i sigma is the constant map at x for every i modulo this relation. This shouldn't be a huge surprise if you've seen the classical definition of homotopy groups before. And as an exercise that I left last time, and that is, it is actually going to be in the exercise sheet, you have to show that this relation of being homotopic relative to the boundary in the case when x is sing of something is just a classical relation. So in particular, these are is the classical notion of homotopy groups. So let me just copy this. But of course, um, these, are, these are not groups yet. Uh, so we should make them groups. And very quickly, let me actually define this. So let's say that let's say that alpha, beta are and simplices with alpha restricted to the boundary, beta restricted to the boundary is constant. Which I mean every phase is is the constant map. Is that sorry? When I say the constant map, I mean of course the the generate simplex, the one that's induced by the map from n to zero, pull it back by the zero simplex x. I hope uh, this terminology is clear. Um, okay, we can define alpha times beta in the following manner. Can't spell anymore apparently. So we construct it as zero from lambda uh, m plus one n into x. Remember, this lambda m plus one n is just a set of all faces of delta m plus one except for the nth such that uh, the m minus one phase is alpha, the m plus one phase is beta, and the other phases are just constant for uh, s minus one. So let me actually draw in the case n equals one, which is the one we should have in mind. So this, we get lambda to one is just this horn here. And this is alpha and this is beta. And uh, by, since X is a can complex, Uh, there exists eta in x m plus one and m plus one simplex such that the restriction of eta to this guy is eta zero. So let me draw here this purple thing. We can fill it in. And then we define alpha dot beta as the nth phase of beta. Alpha comes with beta. And okay. Uh, these, of course, a priori depends on the choice of the two simplex, or the n plus one simplex, eta. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, okay, and as a proposition, uh, the class of alpha dot beta in Pn x x depends only on the class of alpha and the class of beta. And uh, uh, it induces a group operation by um, 
In fact, you can also prove that it's abelian for n greater than one, uh, but we will get it as a consequence of some theorems. You could actually do everything completely simplicial and never mention topological spaces at all, but I'm not going to do that in the interest of brevity. Okay. Okay, questions about this? This definition should sound reasonable. You can try to draw the higher dimensional ones to see that we are doing pretty much what we are supposed to, but I'm going to keep doing the n equals one case for keeping the concreteness here. In fact, I'm going to do the proof. Uh, we'll do only the n equals one case. Uh, because, oh, sorry, <laughs> forgot that here you need n greater or equal than one. Of course, for n equals zero, this doesn't work. You cannot sum points. Uh, anyway, we'll do only the n equals one case, uh, just because I can draw it. Uh, and the proofs are a lot easier to understand when you draw them. In fact, when you translate them back into symbols, they work for every n. But uh, just to be clear, so. Let me do a remark. So, okay, let me do this. Define, defi define alpha, beta, gamma to be a composition pair if there's sigma, no, sorry, I call it eta, two simplex with. Um, Zero, zero phase alpha, first phase gamma, and second phase beta. So you should think. This picture. Um, okay, so the first, so remark. Uh, alpha is homotopic to alpha prime, if and only if alpha x alpha prime is a composition pair. This is just the definition of homotopy that we wrote before, that there is a two simplex. Um, Did I do the right one? No, sorry. Yeah, X alpha alpha prime, of course. Uh, well, this is the, the constant map of X. This is alpha, this is alpha prime. This is what we define to be a homotopy. So now the observation is the following. Oh, and also the other remark in particular, X, uh, no, sorry, that's not what I'm gonna say, but another remark that's saying that alpha X alpha is always a composition pair. Yeah? Because you can take S zero alpha as a two simplex. It's doing this thing. So, okay. Now, key idea is the following observation. So suppose you have alpha, beta, gamma, um, gamma, delta, epsilon, and beta, delta theta composition pairs then alpha delta theta is a composition pair and morally what this is saying this is saying that delta uh, delta 
Alphabete. No. Uh, ah, I wrote in the opposite direction, sorry. Uh, give me one second. No. Um, Delta alpha beta. Yeah, that's alpha. And that's sorry. There's epsilon. Theta and beta, yeah. Yeah, moral is the same as this. Oh, sorry, I wrote it in the wrong order in the notes. I'll fix them. So with these key ideas, for example, we see that, uh, that I'm going to, to explain, for example, you see the suppose that alpha is homotopic to alpha prime, which remember is saying that X alpha alpha prime is a composition pair. And suppose that uh, we have this alpha beta is gamma, alpha prime beta is gamma prime. That is, we have alpha beta gamma and alpha prime beta gamma prime composition pairs. And then you, you apply this lemma and you get that indeed you get X gamma gamma prime. Yeah, it's a composition pair. So gamma is homotopic to gamma prime and so on and so forth. You, you, you can play these games with the lemma and then you need to sometimes insert some additional degenerate simplices uh, to, to get. But the, with this key lemma, then it's just a symbolic manipulation. And let me just prove how you do the key lemma. So you have a two simplex witnessing the first composition pair here, and then you have the second composition, uh, delta goes to epsilon, and then you also have, oh, yeah, keep doing it in the wrong order, okay. Uh, yeah, much better. And then you have these. So if you notice, this is, giving you a map from lambda three, two into X. That I'm going to call, uh, what am I going to call? I'm calling it zeta, zeta zero, sorry. Such that it's zero phase is this, uh, is this alta, alpha, um, data, alpha uh, delta theta, so, Let me just use the same symbol here. Uh, even if I actually mean the two simplex that's witnessing that composition pair, really. And you get the first phase is this delta gamma epsilon, and its third phase is um, alpha beta gamma, has to be, and indeed it is good. So you can extend it to zeta from lambda three in X, and then its second phase is exactly uh, the thing we want. If you remove these, you get exactly, if you remove this vertex, you get exactly the piece we want. Okay, and let me not give more details than that. Um, 
but hopefully the idea is clear of how you, you improve these things. Again, this was not a complete description. I'm going to put a reference where this is worked out in detail. It's an old paper by Kahn, but still very readable. Um, but I mean, as you can see, it's just a, a relatively simple game. Okay. And yeah, I'll fix the notes uh, sometime, probably at about three or so after I've given another talk. Uh, okay, questions about this proof? I have a question. Why do we call these objects composition, composition pairs if they are, are uh, rather triples? Yeah, you are right. I probably should call them composition triples. I just decided the name yesterday at around 8 p.m. and uh, <laughs> I might not have used my best judgment. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I might change the name in the notes. Let me, uh, let me think about this. <laughs> Other questions? No. Okay, then let me put this as an exercise. Uh, this group operation is the classical group operation. On sing. I'm sorry, I'm pi n of sin x comma x, which is the uh, sin y for y. I mean, I think in the case n equals one, it's fairly obvious that it is. Uh, and then the, in the bigger case, you just need to draw bigger diagrams. But Excuse me? Yes. Uh, I might actually have a question. Um, in higher dimensions, our simplices do have more faces than um, two. Yes. So I'm wondering how we can generalize the uh, proof. Essentially, you have to put uh, the generate faces in all the missing slots. All right. And it will work out. I mean, the, there is combinatorics to check, of course, to be checked, of course, but. But that's pretty much as in the definition, for example, of composition, you see, uh, where is it oh, here? Yeah, we are adding the generate faces to, to fill in. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. So we have homotopy, we have an, a notion of homotopy groups. And actually, let me put a remark. If F from X to X prime is a map of can complexes. We get factorial maps uh, F lower star pi n X comma X to pi n X prime comma F of X. We just send the class of alpha to the class of F of alpha. You can see the homotopy relation is trivially satisfied because you can take a homotopy and just apply F to the homotopy and you get a homotopy group for, for in X prime. And it's a group homomorphism, again, because the group composition depends only on the simplicial structure, so. Okay. So next goal. How does interact how does these interact with uh, homotopy is of maps? And to do so, I need an important lemma. First of all, because I haven't defined homotopies of maps of can complexes yet. You might have noticed. Uh, I will. Uh, and uh, the dilemma is actually quite useful. In, in, we'll use it a couple of times in today's discussion. 
Uh, it's going to be a bit technical, so uh, bear with me. Uh, and we will go through this lemma together. So let X be a simplicial set. The following are equivalent. So one X is a can complex. Oh, sorry, before I state this lemma, I haven't defined the most important object yet. Sorry. So let's let me move the lemma down and give you an important definition. Uh, so so okay. ST simplicial sets. I want to define a simplicial set home ST, which is the internal home here, uh, such that it sends brackets n, it sends simplices are maps from S times delta n into T. So intuitively, it's zero simplices are literally, sorry, how many in simplicial sets? Are maps of simplicial sets? It's uh, one simplices are what I want to call homotopies of simplicial sets. It's two simplices are like witnessing compositions of homotopies and so on and so forth. And uh, well, the first question we want to pose is when is this a can complex? And that's where this lemma comes in. That's going to give a good criterion to verify when things are can complexes. So, okay. Uh, is the definition clear? But there's a question. Because the reason is I'm interested is because I want to talk about its pi note, for example, when I want to talk about homotopy classes of maps. But remember, we defined pi note only for can complexes. And you can actually define it more generally, but essentially, I want homotopy of maps to be an equivalence relation. And for that, you really need can complex. Zero, yeah. right? Zero simplices maps f from S to T. One simplices homotopies etc. Okay. So okay, let me. So we have a simplicial set X, and we want to know when it is a can complex. And um, yeah, for every n and for every n greater or equal than zero, and for every zero, do I want zero? Yeah, I guess I want zero. And for every diagram. X and this map is just F F zero F zero morally sends uh, an n simplex like this uh, to Yes, 
it's pre-composition with uh, it's the restriction to delta zero inside delta one there exists a lift and the third part which is actually the thing for every inclusion of some subsets uh, simplicial subsets And every diagram there exists a lift. Okay, let me uh, leave the statement for lemma here. So Yeah. This is saying in some sense that the F0 map here is a trivial vibration. You can always extend uh, sections of, of that along subspaces. Um, in fact, that's literally the definition of a trivial vibration in simple sets, but I don't want to overwhelm you with definitions. Mm. Okay, is the statement of the lemma clear? Okay, before I prove the lemma, let me give you an application of it so you see why we are interested in it. So let me see, for example, proposition. So let S any simplicial set. X a can complex. Then home S X is a can complex, which will be denoted. map s x and call the mapping space and the proof is to use the lemma the proof is verify condition three in the lemma which helpfully is still visible. So, let me run out of, uh, and let me just write what we want. So sorry, home delta one, home S X. Copy this, paste it here. And the point the idea is the using this home this is the same thing as, so first of all, note that you can write these as home S, home delta one X. Just you look at definition, these are literally the same sets. And so to construct a lift like this is the same thing as constructing a lift. So it's at zero. It's at zero. A lift like this. But we can do that because X is a can complex and by the lemma. If you remember, we played a lot of such games last semester. 
moving, moving things from one side to the other. So in particular, if F, G are maps of can complexes, as we say, they are homotopic. If they are equivalent as points of map x comma y so literally there is a path between them in the mapping space i.e there exists h x which restricted to zero is f times one is g and this is an equivalence relation by what we proved uh, which is not completely obvious. I feel it's not super hard to prove directly, but it involves pretty much the same ideas in the proof of this level. Okay. Other questions? So are we ready to go through with the proof of the lemma? Which is probably the most technical result I will prove today. And, uh, but again, I, I, I was torn about, I was tempted to just assume it, but uh, I, I think I want to give you an honest story here uh, to show that I'm not hiding anything secret under the blanket. So. It's kind of beside the point of what we want to discuss in this class. But okay. Proof of the lemma. So remember, one was X is a can complex. Two was this. Yeah, sorry. And three was for all inclusions. Oh, by the way, I'm using F1, but this lemma works also for, uh, sorry, F0, but the lemma works, of course, also for evaluation F1 with the same proof. Um, and I think I might be using later with evaluation F1. But of course, this, there, there's nothing special in, regarding zero here. Okay, so two implies, no, sorry, three implies two is obvious. So let me show, uh, let's see what should we start with. Let's do one implies two. One implies three. No, one implies two. So, okay. We want to show it's a can complex. So we have a map like this. And we want to extend it. And the trick is to consider the following map. This is a map R from delta N times delta one into delta N, uh, which remember delta N times delta one and delta N are both um, posets. So it's enough to, uh, nerves of posets. So it's enough to tell you what they do on, on vertices. 
So we have uh, J zero is J if uh, J is not I plus one, and it's I if J is I plus one. So the restriction is just is just this map of full sets here that sends uh, everything to its place, but it collapses I plus one into I. And uh, J1 is just uh, J. So it's the identity restricted on that. So if you want, it's a homotopy of this collapse map with the identity. And you can check that this, in fact, is a simplicial map. It respects the partial order of this full set. This is the nerve of brackets n times 1. It respects the order. Or if you want, you can just look at what the simplices are. And the point is that, uh, why am I doing this? Because this has the property that R of lambda n times 1, lambda n i times 1, lands in lambda n i. And OK, that's easy enough. But also lambda delta 0 times uh, zero lands here. So we can do a diagram like this. Uh, zero goes to x. Uh, sorry, goes to lambda and i. goes to x. Actually, this component is not important for the diagram. And we can also put it here. Times one, like this. And if you check, this is the identity. Just because R is uh, is defined to be uh, the identity on the one face, so it's enough to construct a lift like this. Sorry, that's one implies. No, sorry, I'm doing not doing one in place two. I'm doing three in place one. Ah, okay. I knew I was messing up some numbering. I'm going to do one in place two later. Okay. Okay, so but why does this lift exist? Well, because if you look at it, now we have this guy and we want a lift to exist. And this is by the adjunction again, the same thing as a lift like this. Because you have this component here, lambda and i times delta one gives you exactly this piece here. The restriction to this guy here gives you exactly this lift here, and the fact that they agree tells you that the diagram commutes. Okay. And actually, I don't want to do that because I'm terrible at drawing, but if you draw what it's mean, this is exactly the way you would imagine 
to, to, to prove this stuff. You have this, this map from a horn and you want to extend it to the to the um, to a two simplex. So first you use the fact, use the, the, the this lifting property to show that you can somehow extend it to some trivial the idea is you have this map from a horn, you extend it to some guy here with a degenerate guy here. And then you, you use this path lifting property to, to, to this, sorry, not path, this homotopy lifting property to fill that in and get a feeling of the original horn. Okay, so let me copy this since it's going to be useful to have it in front of us. Okay, let me go back here. So is this proof of, uh, um, of um, uh, what is it, three implies one clear? Let me, let me put again this drone, the idea of the drone. Okay, uh, two implies three is uh, a very simple argument as usual. Two implies three is again, consider the poset set of pairs uh, of intermediate guys together with a lift on the intermediate thing. As usual, I want to extend a lift from a, from a subset to, to the whole thing. So we take the post set of all such extensions uh, by Zorn. We find, so this requires that if this is F and this is G, the restriction to A is F and F zero H is G restricted to C. Uh, by Zorn, we, we find we find a maximal element. And we use two to show that if the maximal element does not have all simplices, it's not maximal. Let me not give more details than that. We have seen already one proof in this, in this vein. And uh, that's just the idea that you can get B from A uh, by, by adding simplices until you run out of space. And let me instead do uh, one implies two. And this closes the circle. Okay. One implies two is possibly even more technical, but okay. So, concretely, what do we have? We have this guy. And X is a can complex. And we want to find a lift. Well, now we can unwrap things and see that this is two. What am I doing? No, oof. I am doing that I don't know how to count. Okay. 
as before, you, the, this component corresponds to this map, this component corresponds to this map, and the lift corresponds to this. And the idea is that you can get this delta n times delta one from the thing by adding cells along inner horns. So the idea is, so let sigma i from delta n plus one to delta n times delta one. And by the way, this proof is going to look really, really similar to the proof that singular homology is homotopy invariant. That's not a coincidence, uh, but let me leave it at that. So let's consider this simplex sigma i, uh, which corresponds to the member n simplices are just uh, chains of n plus one totally ordered elements in, in this. And so it corresponds to zero, 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 um, one, zero, et cetera, i zero, i one, i n. So if you picture Uh, I1, I, uh, N1, sorry. If you picture the, this poset as this guy, uh, this corresponds to the path like this. And instead, if you if you see this as a prism, This corresponds, for example, so this is the case n equals two and let's say i equals one. This corresponds to this simplex in the prism. So this is zero, zero, uh, one, zero, one, one, two, one. So this was zero, one, uh, two, zero. And if you remember, in the proof of the homotopy invariance of singular cohomology, you, you show that you can build this prism by gluing these simplices one at a time. And that's exactly what we are doing. So the idea is we let uh, what I'm, call, I'm calling bi is just the subcomplex that we want to consider. union with sigma zero, sigma i. So we are adding the first i of these simplices. And there's a subset in, a simplicial subset in delta n times delta one. And so the remark is, well, b minus one is this guy. That's by definition. B n plus B B n, sorry, is actually everything. You you check there is nothing left because every simplex is a subsimplex of some sigma i. And more importantly, you can get B i from B i minus one by gluing this sigma i along an inner horn. So you can write a push up diagram like this. Excuse me? Yes. Yes. Um, could you maybe uh, repeat the uh... The Sorry, I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. Uh, um, can you repeat the sentence about every simplex being the subsimplex of some bi or what yes. was? 
So every simplex in delta n times delta one is contained in some sigma i. That's because what is a simplex? A simplex is just a, a chain, right? Uh, delta is the nerve of this poset. So a simplex is just a totally ordered subset, is a chain of, of remember that we said in a poset, uh, a simplex, is, an M simplex say is a map like this. Right, and you can see that if you look at this this, this picture here, if you the only way to get a, a, a chain of, of things is to do a bunch of them downstairs, then at some point move upstairs and then continue until you you want upstairs. You can never go back because uh, the, the the arrows go always in only one direction. And it's you, you can check that this is containing one of these maximal chains that I described that just go all the way up to I, pick all the points up to I, go upstairs, and then continue until the end. So in particular, the union of this sigma I is delta N times delta 1. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry if this is a bit technical and not that interesting, but again, I wanted to do this proof properly. Um, okay. Uh, so the idea now you start with, you have a map from B minus one into X and you want to extend it to a map from Bn. And the idea, you extend it by induction. So it's enough to show that if you have a map from Bi minus one into X, you extend it to some map from Bi. But this is obtained as a push out here by gluing that along that piece. So it's enough to extend it along this inner horn which we can because X is a kind complex. Okay. Whew. The proof of this lemma has taken a lot longer than I planned to. And I fear I didn't do a great job, but But let's. Uh, Excuse yes. me, could you maybe scroll up a little bit? I yeah. missed the last part. Here? Oh, wait. Is my video moving? Oh, not for me. Okay, it's frozen. That's great. So let me. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, and uh, I don't know why I'm always having technical problems. Okay. Okay. <sighs> now you should be able to see. Yes. Is this where you wanted me to scroll? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry. I wasn't scrolling. I mean, I was scrolling, but the tablet wasn't showing the scrolling. Uh, that's... Uh, this technology is so fancy, but still. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. 
So let's leave this technical lemma behind us and actually try to draw another consequence. Which is, so let X can complex and gamma from delta one into X uh, a path. Then we have a map evaluation zero that I already described to X inducing a map from pi N from delta one X point to that gamma. You can see gamma as a point and home delta one to X to um, X gamma zero and by gamma zero, sorry. Uh, I mean, uh, really, the first phase of gamma. But just the value of gamma on the zero simplex is also is also good. Uh, and this is an isomorphism for every n. And since I mean the habit to give you corollaries of these lemmas. So let me give a construction from this lemma. You can actually get a map like this by taking the inverse of this map. and then using the evaluation at one to land in the other point. And this is a map I'm going to call gamma star, which I don't remember if we discussed in the case of topological spaces last semester, but it's a change of base point map along a path. And that's going to be important because it's going to figure in this following exercise. So suppose you have a homotopy with x restricted to x times 0 is f, h restricted to x times 1 is g, and then let me gamma to be h restricted to the base point times delta 1 then the following diagram commits. And uh, so we have pi n x x, uh, pi n, we said y f of x, this is f lower star, pi 1 y uh, g of x, G lower star, and this is gamma lower star, and just the fun. So that's one thing. And the second thing is suppose that F is a homotopy equivalence. which I actually haven't defined, but it's exactly defined as in the classical case. There is a map G such that GF and FG are homotopic to the identity. Then F lower star is an isomorphism. I think these, this statement, we should have done it last semester. I cannot remember, but... Uh, but it's one of those statements that you have to prove at some point uh, when you talk about higher homotopy groups. Anyway, it's a consequence of this exercise, which is going to be in the exercise sheet. And it's, it's not too complicated, so don't, don't be too worried about it. But So this lemma hopefully is interesting. Let me, so let me copy. Statement. 
que te imaginas. Let me prove. So there's a map. Delta from x to home, delta 1 x. That sends an n simplex here to uh, just what it does. I mean, this is sending x, x to constant maps. And evaluation at zero composed with delta is the identity, as you can obviously verify. And so the corresponding maps are also the identity. In particular, evaluation at zero is, uh, uh, which one it is? It's uh, subjective. So the trick is only need to verify inactivity. So suppose we have alpha, beta from this guy. And remembering what, and such that they are homotopic after evaluating at zero. So what does this mean? This means that there exists eta X satisfying some conditions. I need a new page, so should experiment with infinite scrolling pages at some point. Just afraid they're going to mess up. Um, okay, which I'm not going to spell out, but they're not going to be important. You can verify that they do what they have to do. And so what does this mean then? We have home delta one X satisfying some conditions, by the way, that means that the, the condition, that the restriction to the boundary is something. Sorry, no, that's the important part. The conditions are that the restriction of eta to the boundary is given by certain formula. And so we have eta here, and we have the boundary. And let me call eta zero here, the, the boundary that a homotopy between alpha and beta should have. And let the boundary that a witness alpha beta should have but by the lemma that the characterization there exists eta bar which is exactly the wit which witnesses alpha beta So this map is injective, in fact. And so, and so the, the evaluation at zero and also delta are going to be equivalences on homotopy groups and etc. and so on and so forth. You can play fancy games. And of course I did it for evaluation at zero, but again, evaluation at one is verbatim the same thing. Okay, we have 15 minutes, which should be just enough to prove the main theorem I wanted to prove today. But before we go on with this, um, questions about what I just did. Excuse me, what does the sentence on the right say again? So, what does it mean that alpha and beta are homotopic? It means that there is a, a certain n plus one simplex with a certain boundary. Precisely, its nth phase needs to be alpha, its n plus one phase needs to be beta, and the other phases needs to be constant maps. 
right? So actually, let me spell it out. Uh, sorry, evaluation at zero also. So eta is evaluation zero of beta and di eta is x, right? Uh, sorry, uh, gamma zero, we called it here. And let eta zero be the boundary a witness to, to the homotopy alpha and beta, the, uh, the boundary that a witness to the homotopy between alpha and beta should have. Concretely, this is alpha, it's n plus one phase is beta, and its other phases are just gamma. Okay. I e. Is this uh, is this clear? Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. So, okay. So we have seen the upshot of this whole story is a homotopy equivalence between tan complexes induces an isomorphism on homotopy ah, groups. Okay. I want to prove a vice versa and I want to prove something more. So let me prove, let me state the major theorem. So let X be a can complex then the map from X the sink homotopy of X is a homotopy equivalence. And again, before I prove it, let me record a couple of corollary. So corollary one, let Y be a topological space. Then this other map, I call this eta and I call this epsilon, is a weak equivalence. And how do you prove it? Well, the idea is look at the commutative diagram. Um, well, this is sing of epsilon and this is eta of of, of sing right this is the identity you can check this is just another reformulation that sing and geometricalization are adjoint but you can also check it directly with the formulas i gave you and eta sing y is a homotopy equivalence Uh, by by the theorem, therefore, sing epsilon is a homotopy equivalence 
And I'm slightly cheating here in that I haven't proven that homotopy of maps respects with compositions, but I put it in the exercise sheet. So uh, that's fine. Uh, it's also not hard. It should be the easiest of the three exercises I've given you. Okay, so okay, it of sing is a homotopy equivalence, so sing of epsilon is a homotopy equivalence, uh, but pi n of sing of say z is canonically pi n of z, so we are done. Oh, sorry, so forgot. So sing epsilon is an iso on p n. By an important thing. Uh, that, that, that's what we spent most of today proving. So it's, I should mention it. Okay, so Sing X really knows everything. Sorry, Sing Y knows really everything about the weak homotopy type of Y. And in fact, you can see this is another, another, this corollary also gives you another proof of CW approximation because the geometricalization of sing y is a CW complex, as I noticed. Um, it's not the easiest proof of CW approximation, of course, but since it comes out for free, you might as well notice it. And let me put another corollary. And then I don't think I'll have the time to prove the main theorem, so I think I'm going to let left it as a small leftover for next time, even if the proof is not long. Um, this point. But okay, the other corollary is suppose f from x to y is a weak equivalence of can complexes, i.e. Um, for every x in x, f lower star pn x comma x to pi n y comma f of x is an iso, then f is a homotopy equivalence. And these actually is something you could prove directly. It's not that hard. It, I think I could do it like in 40 minutes, but I'm just going to deduce it from uh, the cellular approximation theorem that you did uh, last semester. Uh, no, sorry, not the cellular approximation, the, the whitehead theorem that you did last semester. Because uh, it's going to be simpler. So consider the commutative diagram. So we have sing geometricalization, sing geometricalization of y, x, y. This is a homotopy equivalence, this is a homotopy equivalence, and this is a weak equivalence. This is a weak equivalence. But this map is a weak equivalence of CW complexes, hence it is a homotopy equivalence. So sing is a homotopy equivalence. Okay. And then you just zigzag your homotopy equivalences around. Again, this is a feels kind of like cheating because it would be neater to prove it directly, but I'm going to take this shortcut. Since we can. And I sl I'm slightly cheating also in not showing you that sing turns homotopy equivalences and homotopy equivalences, but that follows, in fact, from the fact that geometricalization commutes with products somehow, um, which we did. So I don't feel I'm cheating too much. Um, okay. I think I'm going to stop here. Are there questions?
If not, I'm going to conclude. Uh, next time, we're going to tie up this loose end, this, uh, this theorem uh, that I, I mentioned. And it's actually, I should say that it's used, I'm going to prove it using a result that I'm not going to prove. It's going to be in the notes. Uh, that I'm not going, uh, using a simplicial approximation theorem that I'm going to prove in the notes, but not say it in class because it, it would uh, derail us too much. And then we're going to start talking about homotopy coherent diagonals and homotopy limits. And hopefully, uh, these will be almost all the prerequisites we needed or, or not. Anyway, I want to finish either the next lecture or the lecture after all the prerequisites. And before the end of the next week, hopefully we will have defined what a spectrum is and started talking about stable homotopy theory. But we'll see. Uh, and please tell me if I'm going too fast in these lectures because it's the first time I'm teaching this class, I have no idea uh, how how this material is best presented. So, okay, I'm going to stop the recording now.